Good evening, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Professor Stout, Professor Stout's friends and colleagues, a very warm welcome to the 2017 University of Edinburgh Gifford Lectures. My name is Mona Siddiqui. I'm Professor of Islamic and Islamic Studies and Christian Muslim Relations, and also Assistant Principal for Religion and Society um, at the University of Edinburgh. And I'm also a member of the Gifford Lectureships Committee. I'm delighted to welcome our eminent speaker, Professor Geoffrey Stout, Professor of Religion at Princeton University, as he continues his series on the theme, Religion and Bound, Ideals and Powers from Cicero to King. This evening, Professor Stout will deliver his fifth lecture in the series entitled, and the, name of the, the title of the lecture is Slavishness, Democracy and the Death of God. The lecture and question time this evening are being recorded and the video will shortly be available online on the university's Gifford web pages. Following interference over the sound system last Tuesday, I've been advised to request that please could you switch off all unnecessary wireless devices or at least put them on flight safe mode. Professor Stout, I welcome you to the fifth Gifford lecture. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you for that generous introduction. And thank you all for coming yet again. All of the following themes were Emerson's before they were Nietzsche's. The death of God, the resulting loss of priestly authority as a source of state legitimacy, the danger that genius will be swamped by the slavishness of the herd, the resulting need for a smaller band to cultivate genius apart from the herd, and the value of rhetorical categories for analyzing one's culture and one's task. But who, apart from specialists, read, uh, reads Emerson today? And why would we? He believed in freedom. Democracy was his beacon. He placed faith in the transformative power of ethical religion. What a sap. <laughs> Dewey honored Emerson as the philosophy of democracy. A century later, democracy's best before date seems to have passed. Bookstores have moved Emerson to the self-help aisle. We read his sayings on greeting cards and wince. Nietzsche is in every theologian's shoulder bag. Self-reliance is now served black, no sugar, in a Parisian demi -tof. Philosophy, political theory, and theology now know Emersonian themes mainly by way of Nietzsche's anti-democratic variations on them. If the explanation of our world comes in a bottle of frosted glass floating on the sea from a sublime beyond, we are free to condemn our surroundings as wholly rotten, which they so often seem to be. Political theologian wanted, knowledge of Nietzsche, Schmidt, and Zizek required, faith, hope, and charity optional. <laughs> the rare Gifford lecturers who mention Emerson these days portray him as the quintessential liberal, a believer in the sovereign, private, disembodied self. The Scottish press had similar worries when he first lectured here. He was said to preach the impious doctrine that each man, and I'm quoting now from uh, the press statements at that time, an isolated atom, a self-existent, absolute, supreme, and not for others self. Articles dismissed his message as ill-disguised infidelity. He is, quote, grossly heterodox and dangerous to society in its best interests. In January 1848, the Glasgow Athenaeum was a thriving institution. 
When Emerson lectured there a month later, nearly half of its members resigned. Lord Gifford read Emerson more charitably. James Sterling, the first Edinburgh Gifford lecturer, saw Emerson's 1873 visit here as, quote, the great event of the decade. For a student group, Sterling nominated Emerson to serve, believe it or not, as Lord Rector of the University of Glasgow. The only thing more miraculous than that uh, is that Emerson gave permission to have his name put forward in 1873. Sterling acknowledged in a published statement in support of the nomination, uh, acknowledged Emerson's heterodoxy, but added, quote, religion is the very element he breathes. The revulsion under which we at present live is shallow. We may almost say that holiness is Emerson's very attribute proper, and he understands the times. Fuller, Stanton, Thoreau, and Muir illustrate Emerson's impact on feminism and environmentalism. Gandhi cited Emerson in, as an influence at the beginning of Hind Swar Swar Swaraj. A.J. Musty, explaining his roots in an autobiographical essay, said that he had received a volume of Emerson's es essays as a prize for an essay contest he entered as a teenager. If we want to understand modern ideals of ethical religion, the struggle to unbind religion from tyranny and oppression, we had better figure, to figure out what these and many other activists, including Martin Luther King Jr., saw in Emerson. It is 1838, graduation day at Harvard Divinity School. The graduates hope to be hired by churches to preach God's word, interpret the Bible, administer the sacraments, shepherd a flock, and manage a nonprofit organization on the basis of member donations. Emerson has left the ministry. He has reservations about the Lord's Supper, doubts about Unitarianism itself. Yet his topic is the calling of these young men about which they are ambivalent. Isn't that the calling he abandoned? Yes and no. Calling is a dual character concept. His true calling is to speak the word of a living God to call others out of conformity into right relation to divinity. A ministerial calling reducible to a job description is a semblance of a true calling. The living God has called you to have a job in an institution, to avoid causing offense to congregants whose donations might be withheld, to pretend you have fewer doubts than you do. In an 1818 essay entitled On the Clerical Character, William Hazlitt had found the established clergy especially prone, quote, to conform their professions of religious belief to a certain popular and lucrative standard, unquote. Their livelihood and standing depend on conformity, which bends their character to, quote, servility and cowardice. Someone who spends his life, quote, nodding to deans bowing to bishops, waiting upon lords, inured to be his own dupe and the tool of others, will find himself wishing to be conformed to this world rather than transformed. Those are Hazlitt's words in 1818. Hazlitt's father was a, was a non-established, non-conformist clergyman and 
some passages in that essay uh, honor him. Emerson thinks non-established clergy face similar temptations, and he does variations on themes from Hazlitt's earlier essay. You are to preach God's word. The congregation expects exegesis of a closed canon. Quote, men have come to speak of the revelation as somewhat long ago, given and done, as if God were dead, unquote. Or he goes on, the injury to faith throttles the preacher. Well, the young graduates are thinking, a throttled preacher would not be free, or even speaking, let alone speaking truly. Preaching the word can be injurious to faith. Preachers ordinarily behave as if God were dead. Christians do. Las Casas had released his Indian slaves in order to preach a persuasive sermon on the evils of owning Indians. Emerson's listeners are wondering how to preach about the enslavement of Africans, but he is saying that the preachers are slaves. Because no slave can teach, pastors must overcome slavishness in their own lives. Preaching what the congregation wants to hear is conformity. Preaching from a supposedly closed canon deadens the spirit. Preachers are taught to preach as writers are taught to write by imitating excellent models. Emerson says that because, quote, imitation cannot go above its model, unquote, it is slavish. In Self-Reliance, his most famous essay, he adds, imitation is suicide. The virtue in most request is conformity, self Reliance is its aversion. Well, like Hazlitt, Emerson is alluding to Romans 12, 2, and does again in his other most important essay, Experience. Be ye not conformed to the world, be ye transformed. Emerson wrote self-reliance in part to fortify himself against the uproar raised against him after the Divinity School Address. The aversion of conformity is costly. He now knows this. Cicero and Valerius Maximus had previously commended self-trust under such circumstances. Emerson is alluding to them. Is he imitating them? Renaissance writers discussed imitation with Cicero in mind. Erasmus had, in a, in a book on the Ciceronian, had distinguished merely following an exemplar, it's the first kind, second, imitating an exemplar, what, meaning while changing it just a little, and emulating it by striving to improve on it. This is the same rhetorical tradition that mattered to Las Casas. It is preoccupied with examples in every sense. Examples that might illustrate something, a, a point that you're making, uh, the example you present to the audience of some ideal that you are either successfully embodying or not. Lincoln used that word, example, six times in the Lyceum Address. Emerson is calling preachers to exemplary individuality, a form of sacrifice that goes beyond not owning slaves or not buying sugar. Individuality sacrifices the comfort of deferring to one's model the responsibility of thinking for oneself. Why does your congregation need your preaching if they can infer your thoughts from Calvin. Calvin stood for something. Do you merely stand for him? 
If you stand before your congregation as a copy of someone else, you will be speaking as if God were dead, as if God were powerless to impart fresh revelations to an open mind. Slavish imitation of your models, Emerson thinks, dishonors them. What made them worthy of reverence, the reverence you first felt for them, was that they did not merely imitate their models. To emulate them, you must emulate their emulating, not imitate their imitating. That includes Jesus. That includes Emerson. Emerson is not recommending impious one-upsmanship. Your vocation is to rise continually above your conformist self into higher, higher forms of excellence. Typically, you can do this only if someone else's excellence or call provokes you to be ashamed of your established self. Self-reliance is not freedom from influence, but a response you make to a disruptively divine gift of provocation. To make the response demanded of you is to achieve individuality, to become a self-conscious locus of responsibility. You are being called into self-responsibility. And part of the point of this analysis that Emerson is giving is that that is not the same thing as being independent of having been influenced. It is a response to a form of influence. By the time we reach late adolescence, Emerson thinks, we are more or less thoroughly acculturated. What brings us to this point is a process of instinctively imitating our imperfectly virtuous elders and peers. Our habits have taken the shape of theirs. We would not be better off without a language or an upbringing because then we would be ignorant and otherwise ill-equipped for activities we value. But to remain mired in conformity is to fail to take responsibility for your commitments and actions. In conformity, you repeat a given script and leave higher gifts unopened. Self-reliance is exercising responsibility for oneself on behalf of oneself and others beyond the confines of mere conformity. You are to open yourself to the possibility that unauthorized thoughts till now repressed might deserve to be regarded as true, liberating, or otherwise excellent. Let me repeat that line. You are to open yourself to the possibility that unauthorized thoughts that occur to you, till now repressed, might deserve to be regarded as true, liberating, excellent, Self-reliance involves bringing one's repression of unauthorized thoughts to consciousness as something that is going on with us. Conformity maintains itself by generating authorized intuitions, but also by inculcating the habit of repressing unauthorized thoughts. Everyone is called to identify the ideals worthiest of reverence, to test them against experience, and to live in accordance with one's considered view of them. This, Emerson thinks, must be done over and over, as if the power of worthy ideals to transform you and your world were everlasting and something no institution can possess or tame. A minister has the calling of calling others 
to this calling. Society presents itself as a fixed system of roles. In fact, all societies are in flux, Emerson says. He identifies the topic to which he will devote his career in the following words. It is easy to see that a greater self-reliance must work a revolution in all the offices and relations of men, in their religion, in their education, in their pursuits, their modes of living, their association, in their property, in their speculative views, unquote. He wants to understand this. This is his description of his own vo vocation, to understand this. He wants others to understand this. Self-reliance is the antidote to mere in, uh, imitation, mere imitation of the most impressive influences on you, and it's also an antidote to servility in relationships of unequal power. Servility is the sort of conformity manifested in submission to oppressive social relationships. Think of students trying to please their recommenders or Americans driving while black. In the absence of effective accountability, the vastly weaker party has an interest in eliciting benevolent treatment from the powerful. Servility and slavishness are the traditional names for the vicious habits one acquires while currying favor with the dominant. The mentality of any group is corrupted by the selfishness, cowardice, and other vices of the people who inhabit it, often by group egotism. When Emerson recommends treating oneself and each other as, quote, a sovereign state within a sovereign state, he is saying that you and they, not you alone, have the authority and the responsibility to set straight the relationships in which you find yourselves. A slavish self formed under oppressive social conditions lives in fear. The fear is not irrational in itself. When a white cop frisks an innocent black youngster in my country, the youngster has reason to be afraid and just cause for anger. Yielding just then need not be servile. But when the cowering before your oppressors becomes habitual, it can reinforce the, the oppressive relationship, thus making you complicit in your own oppression. For the oppressed to resist oppression, they must also resist their own servility. They must cease to respond as sheep respond to their shepherds and to their fellow sheep. Nietzsche depicted democracy as a process that absorbs individuals into the herd. He probably got the herd metaphor from Emerson, who probably got it from Milton. Emerson reserves the name democracy for a form of sociality that encourages resistance to the herd. So there's a very important semantic difference in the use of the term democracy in these two authors. Democratic individuality for Emerson is not what you achieve by affirming yourself as a monad, but what you achieve under the influence of others who call you into responsibility. In a community of mutually responsible selves, each is sufficiently individuated to be capable of standing for something and to be appropriately held responsible by others. In a society corrupted by oppression, virtuous individuality must often be won by overcoming servility. 
With the Exodus story, the Roman historian Tacitus and many early modern writers in mind, Milton warned his former Republican allies in the English Civil War against acquiescing in the restoration of monarchy. If I might quote Milton, monarchs will never permit whose aim is to make the people wealthy indeed, perhaps, and well fleeced for their own shearing and the supply of regal prodigality, but otherwise softest, basest, viciousest, servilest, easiest to be kept under, and not only in fleece, but also in mind, but in mind also sheepishest. That is 1660. A decade earlier, he had cautioned against deferring to, quote, a credulous and hapless herd begotten to servility. And six years before that, he warned Parliament that if the waters of truth, quote, flow not in a perpetual progression, they sicken into a muddy pool of conformity and tradition. Had he read Emerson? Quote, we can grow ignorant again, brutish, formal, and slavish, as ye found us, but you then must first become that which ye cannot be, oppressive, arbitrary, and tyrannical. Same vocabulary we've been explicating now for five lectures. In 1624, the Scottish pamphleteer Thomas Scott wrote that you cannot learn the news from courtiers, from members of court, because they, quote, dare not speak what they know and what they ought for fear of losing that preferment. Did he know Sean Spicer? In a society marred by such dependency, Scott wrote, the truth, quote, which is known to the lowest does not reach the ears of the highest. That's a point later stressed by John Dewey. Okay. So part of the notion here is that when you have the social relations in this form, and then when you have servility as the predictable consequence of the power imbalance, one thing that happens is that information does not flow in the right way. And Dewey, not knowing that he's following Scott, uh, recommends as one of the principal reasons for adopting a democratic culture the improved circulation of information from highest to lowest and back again. A year earlier, Scott had presciently complained that, quote, the corruption of manners hath let in that Trojan horse laden with trumperies. In the true leveler's standard advanced, Gerard Winstanley reports a voice heard in a trance demanding full equality for laborers to others in creation. But he then declares, quote, to all laborers or such as are called poor people, that they shall not dare to work for hire for any landlord or for any that is lifted up above others, for by their labors, they have lifted up tyrants and tyranny, and by denying to labor for hire, they shall pull them down again. He then says that people professing religion while nonetheless resting, quote, upon the bare observation of forms and customs, display hatred for the power of the spirit. That's Winstanley. He infers two conclusions from the oppressor's hidden dependency on the oppressed. 
One is that the oppressor is himself rendered servile by oppression. The other is that the oppressed are complicit in their own subjugation insofar as they submit to it. Servility exacerbated by false religion, the false religion of bowing down before worldly masters inhibits the courageous and cooperative action required of both oppressor and oppressed to set the basic relationship straight. This recognition resurfaces two centuries later in Hegel, Marx, Hayrick, Emerson, Thoreau, and then yet again, somewhat later, in Gandhi, Beauvoir, King, Barry, Baldwin, Malcolm X, and Fennell. The relevant passage from Walden begins by figuratively describing railroad workers as sleepers and concludes, I am glad to know that it takes a gang of men for every five miles to keep the sleepers down and level in their beds as it is, for this is a sign that they may sometime get up again. <coughs> True religion for Emerson is a virtue, a sentiment, an attitude, and an evolving collection of activities. It has divinity as, it ulti as its ultimate end, and pious acknowledgment of dependence on divine power as its expressive fruition and formative function. Behaving as if God were alive for Emerson involves opening yourself piously in grateful reception to the influx of divine spirit. Sitting in contemplative silence before a church service begins and taking a long walk in Walden Woods are practices he considers conducive to pious reception. Tradition teaches that faith in contrast to religion is a divine gift not achievable by human effort. Emerson uses rhetorical categories to reinterpret this contrast before affirming it. Emerson's faith does not count, uh, it, well, Emerson's faith, the content of it, does indeed count as infidelity from uh, an orthodox point of view, this much is obvious. The proper object of faith for him is not a personal God, but an impersonal power responsible for all finite excellence. Faith in that power unleashes creative power into the world. Faith matters politically, not because it licenses arbitrary appeal to a truth believed on the basis of inconclusive evidence but because it supplies confidence in ideals that free us from what he calls conformity and mean egotism. To experience such confidence is to abandon the conformist self one still has, and one hopes to begin a journey toward what he calls the unattained but attainable self that one is called to be. There is nothing atomistic or selfish about such individualism. Churches are institutions. Institutions are necessary, beneficial, dangerous, and prone to ossification. This is Emerson's view. Worshiping them confuses something created with its divine creator. The point applies also, he thinks, to the worship of persons. The person of a saint or hero is an effect of divine power. Such persons are worthy of admiration, not worship, Emerson thinks. Bowing down before persons kills your own spirit. True worship directs itself to the excellence that is the source of finite goods. The eye makes the horizon. Emerson wrote in experience. Jesus, 
he says, is an example, a paradigm of a good man, who for a time has stood at the center of the horizon. Looking at him with a combination of love and a forbearance to press objection is what creates the halo. To treat someone as a personification of divinity or virtue is to select one example out of many and to filter out narrative details that would trouble the relation of exemplification. Jesus, he thinks, is a figure of virtue on whom, quote, many people are agreed that these optical laws shall take effect. Emerson is writing here in a, a context that stresses the subjective perspective of the witness or the follower. His considered view is more dialectical. On the considered view, figures of virtue and those interpreting them play reciprocal roles. The saint or hero comes to stand for something in part by avoiding acts incompatible with some ideal. But the role can be sustained only if others are contributing both love and forbearance to press objection. The authority of representative figures, and his use of the phrase representative men to talk about this is interesting for its combination of rhetorical language and political language, the authority of representative figures, their actual entitlement to a degree of deference and honor, derives from their self-reliant resistance to the conformist suppression of nonconformist thoughts. In inspired words and deeds, he says, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty, which is the source of their power on Emerson's view. You've already repressed these thoughts. Someone else has the courage to say them out loud and live according to, to them. And you recognize that you've had that thought, repressed it. That's the source of the power of the charismatic figure. This is Emerson's value-laden social perspectival theory of ethical, religious, and political conduct. In each of those domains, we stand for something before others. In ancient assemblies, standing on one or another side of an aisle expressed one's stance on a proposal. A moving speech moved listeners from one side of the aisle to the other. To be virtuous was to stand for something, to make your body, your voice, your stance exemplify it. And to do so before others who might be moved by you to stand with you or left opposed to you across the aisle unmoved. It was to offer yourself as an example to others. The central spiritual questions for Emerson are what ideals you stand for and how. To stand for something is to embody it in your words and deeds. Each individual or group has various motives, one or more of which congeals into a principle of conduct that determines character. What an individual, group, nation, or age stands for is determined by what it actually sacrifices for what. To understand the modern age, he thinks, one needs to grasp the interplay of democratic aspirations on the one hand and the desire to make, own, and control material goods on the other. And much of his thinking about England in particular and England as a possible model for Americans has to do with the competition 
in the behavior of these nations between two very different sorts of motive. So both of these are ways of exemplifying something. The former, like the latter, is a form of power. That is, um, making your life embody democratic ideals is a form of power. And that claim is something Emerson finds encouraging. When he was deciding to take his stand for abolition, Emerson rejected his earlier idealism, which was called transcendentalism, for being complicit in slavery. A withdrawal into one's own inner life can lose touch with the public world. It can reinforce oppression by merely negating it moralistically. The material practice of slavery is idealism's evil twin. It is what the world looks like when not infused with an ideal higher than avarice. Idealism, or he calls it in the prefatory poem to the essay Experience, he calls it spectral wrong, so it's ghostly, is a mere ought. The spirit's ghostly withdrawal from its conditions renders those conditions spiritless. The spirit of spiritless conditions, wrote Marx. Spirit that does not risk embodiment in action evaporates into mere subjectivity. An ideal incarnate in one person moves others. To witness this firsthand, he thinks, is moving. It is to be caught up in a movement. It is to experience the intensity of higher stakes and the sublimity of sacrifice. This is what it takes to fight injustice. No great transformation occurs without enthusiasm and sacrifice. The project of preventing religious war by separating religion thoroughly from politics, he thinks, is unrealistic. Revolutions are inevitable. They cause disruption. They incarnate ideals in material practices as the diggers plowed their ideals into George's hill. Religions and states are concretized institutional effects of movements. One person's embodiment of an ideal is the germ of a movement, which eventually ossifies if, it's, if it lasts. In a remark intended more to encourage heroic action than to capture the sociological complexities, Emerson famously writes, an institution is the lengthened shadow of one man. His more gendered trope for this is ejaculation. He gives five examples of shadow casters, the last of whom is Clarkson. In the chapter on religion and English traits, Emerson cites many facts that Nietzsche or Weber would assemble into a simpler story of secularization. Quote, silent revolutions have made it impossible that men such as Moore and Cranmer should return. Anglicanism preaches as its gospel, Emerson says, by taste ye are saved. The enthusiasm that set that religion in motion has ossified into something that appears, he says, appears innocent of the New Testament. Quote, she has nothing left but possession, unquote. Then we get to the chapter's final paragraph. And he asks whether the religion of England is to be found in the established church or in the schismatic sects. And his answer is, well, that neither of those. 
quote, if religion be the doing of all good, and for its sake the suffering of all evil, the religion of England is to be found in Clarkson, Florence Nightingale, and quote, in thousands who have no fame, and in Samuel Romilly, a deist, he doesn't say this, but he's a deist who paid eloquent tribute to Wilberforce in Parliament in 1807 for his abolitionist uh, activities. A society or movement is democratic for Emerson insofar as it embodies liberty and justice for all in its relationships, arrangements, and culture. Political liberty, in the Cicero-Milton sense, is security from being at someone's mercy in the way that a slave is at the mercy of a master. Democracy adds that there must be no arbitrary restrictions on full membership in a fully democratic culture Individuals treat themselves and one another as loci of authority and responsibility, and everyone is called to awaken and rise. This does not mean that everyone has the same talents or access to the same excellences. Only some are called to spend their lives intentionally calling others to rise, providing spiritual leadership to the community, and reflecting on the demands of the transformation underway. Emerson speaks of what he calls a natural aristocracy as distinct from the, quote, actual aristocracy of inherited power and wealth. The two, he says, are unrelated. His calling is to minister to the former, which he says might turn out on critical inspection to include no gentleman or lady. Emerson's democratic culture neither levels excellence nor reduces everyone to the same role. Emerson dissociates what he calls true democracy from direct rule by the commons and from democratically disguised oligarchy. False democracy passes itself off as virtue. That's why the term is worth fighting over. Mobocracy is the right name for rule by the herd. The herd is an undifferentiated mass prone to group egotism and resentful violence against arbitrarily chosen enemies. People who remain in that condition, Emerson says, can neither think for themselves, deliberate with one another, show one another regard as loci of authority, nor rise above hatred and egotism. But no one is inherently a herd member. Everyone is called to rise out of servility into self-reliance. Nietzsche retained the notion of a natural aristocracy, but rejected this democratic addendum. If most people are incapable of rising into excellence, if they are at best mediocre and by nature slavish, if they are incapable of freedom, then democratic ideals like Emerson's are misguided. Emerson was right to interpret religion, ethics, and politics rhetorically as, quote, a mobile memory, a, a mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms. He was right about the need to cultivate and value excellence, but he was wrong to think democracy capable of fulfilling that need. Christianity, according to Nietzsche, began in a nastier, nastier sort of enthusiasm than Emerson supposed. It did not embody an intuitive recognition of the divine power of ideals. Regardless whether Jesus was motivated by ideals, historical Christianity in fact, exemplifies the slavishness of the weak. Slavish resentment is what it truly stands for, whether it wishes to or not. 
Christianity first ossified into orthodoxy and then morphed into secularized democracy. Throughout these phases of cultural history, the weak have, unfortunately, dominated the strong. Self-reliance is ill-suited to the religious character. Democratic freedom and equality are, in Nietzsche's view, secularized residues of Christian slave morality. The attempt to love everyone exhibits resentful envy toward the excellence of the strong, combined with pity toward the weak. The triumph of the weak weakens all. Meantime, the secularization of equality deprives the state of its theological legitimation. Because God is dead, treated as such in the behavior of modern democratic citizens, because God no longer motivates most people to obey state authority, the state's days are numbered. The only hope for the strong, while the state crumbles, is to form a marginal cult of superior men, inspired by the lonely one, but supported by one another's friendship. Correcting those who take Nietzsche to be exclusively interested in the solitary overman, Hugo Droschen highlights the role of fellowship among the excellent few. Droschen points to the impact on Nietzsche of Wagner's artistic legislator, who embodies an ideal so fully that he exercises dictatorship over the excellent. In Nietzsche's later work, this cohort is called the Party of Life. Members of this party achieve a healthy agonism among themselves while engaging in a struggle with their mortal enemy, the Party of Christianity. An individual resists absorption into the herd, exercises authority over others who share the same concerns, and aspires to engage the smaller band in a beneficial process of transformation. How then shall this be done concretely without sacrificing the concerns that unite the smaller band? For Emerson, the question is how ideals can be transformed into practical power without being ruined. Democratic ideals exert beneficial power by being exemplified in the lives, relationships, and arrangements of the people involved. Ideals not incarnated in action are spectral wrong. But democratic ideals can be actualized, according to Emerson, only if the excellent few behave democratically, by which he means by calling everyone to rise and eschewing opportunities to dominate others. Nietzsche appears to want no part of those restrictions. There are many visions of the smaller band, aside from Emerson's, Wagner's, and Nietzsche's. Ripley's Morning Star at the Brook Farm, Lenin's Revolutionary Avant-Garde, Weber's New Prophets beyond the iron cage, Crane's visionary company, Eliada's new humanists, Benjamin's tradition delivered anew from the conformism which is on the point of overwhelming it, Rorty's exclusive clubs seeking semantic authority over their own words, Cavarero's separatist scene of narrativity, Agamben's isolation of the Shekinah, McIntyre's virtuous remnant awaiting a new Saint Benedict, Hauerwas's peaceable community of character, Marcopolis's cloud of light. Emerson asks three questions when evaluating such visions, at least implicitly. First, are the ideals being affirmed intuitively acceptable 
and capable of sur surviving essayistic testing. The essay is meant in his work, in his hands, to be a genre for testing the intuitions and for receiving uh, critical response from an audience. Second, can the ideals be made actual in sustainable material practices with which we can, in good conscience, identify? Third, by what means and with what likely effects is this supposed to be done? It is not enough for a self-anointed excellent few to separate itself from the herd. What I think I've just illustrated through these examples is this is one of the most common um, tropes in uh, late modern thought. To become more than a mere ought, an acceptable vision must be actualized in roles, relationships, arrangements, activities, and persons. Potential recruits are well advised to look critically at these while keeping traditional concerns about tyranny and oppression in mind. A vision that endorses dictatorship within the smaller band is likely to legitimize dictatorship on a larger scale if the smaller band comes to power. A vision that blurs power relations within the smaller band is asking for trouble. A vision that drops the concept of domination from its practices of self-criticism invites domination. One reason Emerson delayed overt identification with abolitionism was his desire to determine whether it could be the democratic change it was calling for. He also wanted to assess the ethical demands of the role he eventually came to play in it. What would it be to liberate a Fuller, a Thoreau, a Whitman, a Muir, or a Gifford for relations of mutual recognition rather than turning them into mere echoes of, uh, or followers, imitators, copies of himself? Nietzsche wished, as he put it in a, an, uh, 1875 letter that, quote, the church and the state would devour one another, perhaps uh, because he affirmed traditional religion's uh, functional efficacy in legitimizing the state and forming obedient subjects to central assumptions and the traditional discourse of religion that I've explicated in these lectures. Perhaps for that, because he accepted that idea, he did not see how the state could survive in a secularized culture. The separation of religion from politics would inevitably result in the state's demise. According to Droshan, Nietzsche hoped that decentralized pockets of superior individuals would one day be able to dominate ordinary people in a sort of caste system thus reversing the domination of the strong by the weak in modern democracy. In an early essay entitled The Greek State, Nietzsche wrote that, quote, slavery belongs to the essence of culture. The real political question for anyone who, who is persuaded by this view is simply which sort of domination to prefer or who is going to dominate whom. In contrast, Emerson, Fuller, Martineau, Gandhi, Musty, and King all deny the inevitability of, den of domination. They take relations of inclusive non-domination to be possible, desirable, fragile, and prone to corruption. Emerson infers the possibility of such relations from what he takes to be their actuality he cites the English Commonwealth of 1648, the emancipation of slaves in the British West Indies, and the Haitian Revolution. In such examples, a particular relationship marred by domination is set right in some respect. 
Emancipation from slavery can leave someone in other forms of subjection, such as wage labor, uh, wage labor slavery, or uh, patriarchal marriage. The struggle for freedom and equality is perpetual for Emerson. First, because of how many forms of domination there are, and second, because new forms of domination are constantly taking shape. There is no simple progress in Emerson's vision of history. Is a turning of the tables the best to be hoped for? If so, the only alternative to being dominated would be to dominate at least some others. And that, as we saw, was the classical view. Democratic morality can then be dismissed as a dishonest attempt to maintain mastery. It avowedly opposes domination as such, but is actually one of the most successful forms of domination ever devised. Why should we accept this dark conclusion? To make a persuasive case for the dominance of low motives in democracy and Christianity, you would need to try your best to make sense of it more charitably and explain why the effort had to fail. This is not Nietzsche's method. His genealogy uh, of morality is subtitled a polemic, a genre for a culture warrior disinclined to temper enmity with mercy. Emerson, in contrast, is always looking for proof that ideals uh, can be efficacious. His 1844 address on the West Indian emancipation, that's the lecture in which he first publicly came out for abolition, places the English abolitionists in the best possible light. Quote, other revolutions have been the insurrection of the oppressed. This was the repentance of the tyrant, unquote. If New England whites can be brought to admire their English counterparts, perhaps another emancipation will come. That seems to be what he's thinking. He's also thinking that Wilberforce is harder to debunk than someone like Lincoln's Dr. Roth. What if more New Englanders were like Clarkson? Emerson concedes too weakly that, in part, the emancipation is the earning of blacks. But the address uh, does not end there. What he really wants, it becomes evident at the end, is a clearer case of exemplary black self-assertion. He next interprets the Haitian Revolution as a world historical event. It is Toussaint Louverture, not Clarkson, whom Emerson honors as the anti-slave, another key moment of personification as a rhetorical trope. Emerson's journals contain a draft in which he refers at this point to Frederick Douglass. Emerson probably deleted the reference in order to make the event less awkward for Douglass, who was on the stage during the address and followed Emerson to the lectern. But I take it that the rhetorical purpose of this move at the end of the address is to do something in relation to Douglas. The Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society had organized the event. Churches refused to host it. When Thoreau rang a church bell to assemble the crowd, he had to wrestle a sextant for the rope Fuller remarked that Emerson's delivery was uncommonly passionate. He called the audience out of complicity in slavery. He implicitly conferred moral authority on Douglas while calling him into recognition of his responsibility as a personification of anti-slavery. It was because the movement then taking shape was neither a herd a mere ought, a dictatorship, nor a failed utopia, 
that later movements considered it worthy of emulation. Emerson bequeathed to them a democratic vocabulary for discussing ideals, powers, oppression, conformity, transformation, slavishness, self-reliance, exemplarity, virtue, and religion. He didn't make any of that up. He inherited it from a deep and long tradition. He tweaked it as he saw fit to uh, emulate uh, the people he thought worthy of emulation, emulate their emulating. What became of these concepts in the 20th century? Would a Nietzschean, Weberian, or Marxist vocabulary serve us better? To these questions, I shall turn in my final lecture on Thursday. Thank you very much. Jeff, in, in discussing Emerson's pursuit of the unattained self, you use the term ashamed, some sort of shame for the attained self. And I see this feature of Emerson's thought, and it, it bothers me. It disturbs me that I see that shame can be a uh, propellant towards, towards a future self. But I worry that it can also turn into debilitating self-disgust. Is there a way, I mean, if, if there's any response to that in terms of, of Emerson or your, your usage of the term shame, I'd be curious to hear that. But I'm also curious, is there a way to have a more affirming uh, acceptance of the present self and yet still propel forward to the unachieved self? Or does it take something like a consecrated self-hatred to keep one pursuing one's, one's, one's unattained self and one's ideals? I, I don't think, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I don't think Emerson has in mind self-hatred. Look, em Emerson is primarily a rhetorician of encouragement. And if he, uh, uh, the usual criticism of him is that he is, optimistic, affirming, but I, the, the way the rhetoric works, Dante Milton style, is often to take you into hell and out again, to use the um, expression that a great reader of Emerson, Kenneth Burke, later uh, emphasized when talking more generally about uh, the importance of um, the right kind of criticism. So the, the, the right kind of criticism allows you to understand the, the extent to which you are complicit in injustice, right? But doesn't then leave you wallowing in the experience of guilt. And um, Kenneth Burke does a wonderful job of arguing for the importance of what he calls a cult of style. There's another instance of the smaller band. A cult of style that will, um, that will not engage in the kind of critique that just repeatedly depresses the audience and leaves it unable to act. And uh, he takes Emerson to be one of the people who uh, who does better than that. But it doesn't help to leave out the negative moment. Otherwise, there's no, there's no reason to move forward. I don't think he thinks of this as self-hatred. There's no doctrine in, in the mature Emerson, there's no doctrine of a true self that is hidden there that you're you're, you're, you're going to um, hate or love. The, the, the image that occurs at the beginning of the essay experience, uh, one, of the essay, one of the few essays that was never a lecture because it's so complicated in its rhetorical structure, it could never be taken in orally. He begins with the idea of being on a stair. Where are we? We're, we're on a stair. And there's a, we can see a few steps above us, and we can see a few steps below us. 
uh, but we can't see all the way up. The implication ends up being that we might be on different stairs because we have different vocations. This is a secularized version of a Protestant notion of vocation as something that falls to each individual uniquely. Um, and then you're, you're meant to realize where you are on this staircase and that there is always some higher form of excellence into which you are being called. You might experience that excellence in its embodiment in someone else and then look at yourself and say, well, you know, what am I doing with my life? Well, that needn't lead to a debilitating self-hatred. That would be the opposite of what Emerson would be hoping for. Does Emerson define a frontier between servitude on the one hand and susceptibility to influence on the other? You mentioned that distinction, I think, in the course of the lecture, and I'm wondering just where, where the boundaries of each of those lie. Emerson is one of the least definition-related authors ever to put pen to paper. So the, the, the straightforward answer is no. What he doesn't do is define it. Um, what he does is he repeatedly works through the various ways of using the key terms so that through their echoes and ringing the changes on them, you can begin to get a sense of their history and a sense of the extent to which um, you have choices to make about that to which the terms will refer and what the implications of using the words in that way will be. So there, there's, a, there's a point where Nietzsche says, if a, a word can be defined only if it doesn't have a history. Well, that's sort of true. Um, a word can be defined for a particular purpose in use on a particular occasion. And Emerson works his way toward using words in particular ways. But once he gets to the punchline, he's already taken you through, through quotation, allusion, and many forms of resignification to see what's at stake in using words. We have to, when, on all the key questions, we are bound to be using words that trail blood behind them and have been objects of const contestation. Uh, they're all ropes that have been pulled back and forth by competing forces. All of this is retained by Nietzsche, these themes. But when Emerson rings the changes on these words and brings out their history in the way he does, um, he's leading you up to a point where now you can see him making his choices and you can realize that you now are being called to make your own and that they, they, the understanding that your, your decisions might very well not be his. So let's think of this for a second. Um, on that issue of whether persons should be worshipped, nearly all of the ministers who wait in New England who awaited Emerson's next pronouncement in order to write their next sermon on the issues of the day and the struggle over slavery, especially after the Fugitive Slave Act, they didn't agree with him on that point at all. His way of writing gave them room to have that disagreement, and then, but also to, uh, uh, to be influenced by him and, and for the influence to flow in the other direction. And this is part of the image of um, a properly individuated democratic society and movement where the, the various parties involved would actually be 
um, capable of recognizing one another as loci of authority and responsibility and give and take and call and response. I'm not sure that helped, but I just. Jeff, another magnificent lecture, though. I mean, that, the appropriate response is just silence to take it all in because nobody has, has lectured with such subtlety and profundity about Emerson since Stanley Cavell, and you're taking it to a new level, and it's going to be fascinating to see the response once the text comes out. Sorry, just for the people they want you to speak up. Oh, yes. I was saying some truthful things about my dear brother <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> But, Could but, you hear in the back? <laughs> I want to make sure you hear that. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to summary, it's just saying how brilliant he is. Yeah, they're not since, since Stanley Cavell, who really is a pioneer, but Jeff is now taking it to a new level. But of course, I want to bring in Melville here because I think the, uh, the revival of Emerson uh, should go hand in hand with the revival of Melville in terms of what it means as artists to wrestle with the catastrophic challenges and cat catastrophic realities of we, spiritually driven, morally latent agents that we are. And what, what, what do you make of the claim that Melville thinks that maybe Nietzsche does have a point in terms of the inability of the demos to generate the kind of capacities required to overcome domination? to actually enact some inclusive non-domination beyond interpersonal relations, beyond philia and friendship. Because I think Melville has the same deep democratic pathos and orientation, but he believes that America seems to be capable of counter-revolution much more readily than its capacity for revolution in a democratic form. And if that is the case, and it's always open-ended, but given what the evidence seems to be, Melville dies 1890s, Emerson 18, 1880s, that uh, what, what do you say about that Melvillian challenge to your very powerful and, and, and poignant and profound reading of, uh, of Emerson? And we should say it, it, it's Stoutian, too. Uh, we don't want to downplay the Stoutian element of the recovery of Emerson. This is not unmediated Emerson. This is a history of the present connected to a history of the past that is true to the spirit of Emerson's text. But at the same time, it's a wrestling with where we are in this Trump moment. Well, the, 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 the main reason that Emerson appears in these lectures and Melville doesn't is that the lectures are focused on the notion of religion. And it's the same reason that I didn't comment last time on Shakespeare uh, as interpreted by Emerson. I, I, um, look, w w one, of the, w one of the ways we go wrong as academics is focusing excessively on single figures. So um, how, uh, it's so often the case that someone comes up Comes, uh, immerses him or herself in one or another figure while writing a dissertation, uh, and then spends a career essentially turning that figure into a single idol that is going to be reinterpreted in the most charitable way possible to answer any sort of objection. I don't want that to happen to, to Emerson as I'm portraying them, portraying him. And uh, one way I would put it would be to say, in my view, it matters that the cloud of witnesses is plural. That is to say, um, it is because the tradition includes these voices. So um, think, think back to the debates that were being held a, a, a number of decades ago about Baldwin versus Ellison as if we didn't need both of them on the bookshelf. Ellison is the more Emersonian figure, and Baldwin the more Melvillian one. Well, if we, we need Melville, Hawthorne, and Emerson from the Concord of those days, as well as Thoreau, and if we miss out on any of them, we're missing something important that can't be had as well in another form. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the evening's drawing to a close, but before I thank Professor Stout, I want to thank personally Anna Conroy from the Gifford Committee. <laughs> Anna and her colleagues have worked assiduously as they work each year for the Gifford Lectures uh, in trying to put together not only the comfort of the lecturer them, him, himself or herself, but also in trying to make sure that the publicity, the comfort, the, all the background stuff is done to the optimum level. So thank you, Anna, and for all the work you've done. We still have, of course, the RSE uh, discussion tomorrow and also on Thursday, the final lecture. So I'm hoping that you'll all be back, despite the Edinburgh sun. And uh, just please join me in giving a warm uh, applause to Geoffrey Stout for yet another scintillating lecture. <laughs>